Hey, deserving listeners, a lot of you have been sending me emails about your stories and your questions about religion. And it's something that isn't talked about enough, especially in psychology and psychotherapy circles. And so I've done my part to talk about it a little bit. To further the conversation, I thought I would play an interview that I was on another podcast. They interviewed me, and I thought I would play that. This is a podcast called the You Have Permission podcast. You Have Permission. It's a progressive Christian podcast, and they talk about psychology and beyond. And it's hosted by Dan Koch. So let's just get to that interview. Dr. Kirk Honda, thank you so much, man, for joining me today. I am a a fairly recent convert to your podcast, even though you are like a OG podcaster. 12 years now, I think, right? Yeah, 12 years, over a thousand episodes, so many hours of me yammering into a microphone. Yeah, exactly. Uh, The show is called Psychology in Seattle. I love the show. I love how many diverse topics you tackle. And as I move closer and closer to myself being a clinician, I know it's going to be even more and more helpful. But most recently in the episode on evangelicals and conspiracy theories and stuff like that, I pulled directly from your episode on conspiracy theories and what makes people likely to believe in them. So people might remember your name from that episode. This is the guy, you guys. This is that guy in the flesh. Uh, But we're not talking about conspiracy theories today. We are talking about really faith and clinical practice and treatment and trauma and sort of where religion and spirituality overlap with your work as both a clinician with your own clients, but you're also a professor. Besides being a podcaster, you teach at Antioch University, one of the programs here in Seattle. So I know that you, for various reasons, professional reasons, you don't talk about your specific religious beliefs today, but in an episode that I really enjoyed, you did talk about the way you were raised. And I think that that can be helpful to give us some background. So can you give us a 30,000 foot view on your religious upbringing? Yeah, I was born in 1970 and we moved to Issaquah. If you're a local, you know where that is. And it was a very small town, kind of rural at the time. And there were very few churches at the time. And so my parents joined the local church, Issaquah Christian Church. And at the time it was in a tiny little trailer next to the fish hatchery, if you're familiar. And it was a bunch of, you know, semi hippie people that had young kids in 1970. And the brand of Christianity that it was, was called non-denominational meaning that at least this non-denominational church was focused on the sort of common factors, if you will, across not only Christianity and all its various sects, but also across other religions, meaning that love is the answer, forgiveness is the answer, community is the answer. And I don't remember hearing anything about politics. I don't remember hearing anything about the sort of things you hear from evangelicals today. And I just felt I went to day camp. I went, you know, I have three siblings. We, the six of us would go to church together. It was a total event every Sunday. And uh, my parents were quite devout and me and my siblings were quite devout. I was baptized by my father in Lake Sammamish because that's how our church would do it. It was very um, non-hierarchical, if, if you know what I mean, it, it, as, as a church, very community sort of grassroots. And I loved that upbringing, and I have almost no negative memories of going to church. And being in the youth group uh, as a young teenager was a huge part of my development in terms of my self-esteem and and really leading me to become a therapist, being psychologically minded. I mean, in youth group, we would sit around in a circle and talk about our feelings and talk about our angers right. and our hurts and our aspirations. And... Uh, you know, the, the youth minister was probably 23 at the time, but he was seemed so old to me. And there were older right. kids who were a few years older. I really looked up to them. And yeah, I just have so many wonderful memories of, about my experience. And, and the thing that has carried with me into being a professional is compassion and love. I explicitly talk about love as a therapist and as a professor. I think that our profession in psychology and in mental health is primarily a profession of love and compassion. 
And we should be explicit about that. We can be professionals and we could be ethical and we could have professional boundaries. But at the core is what I believe to be 95% true for people when I talk about this is at the core, the reason why we enter this field is because we want to love other people. We want to have compassion. We have compassion and we want to help. And we believe in the goodness of other people. And all of that, I believe, had a big part, uh, you know, all of my upbringing in church and the community had a, had a huge impact on me in that way. And I'm, and I'm really quite grateful for that. Having said that, Issaquah Christian Church has become more political. So if you just Google the, the, their website, it, I don't know if it says any more, but a few years ago, the last time I checked it, literally says on one page that they do not support gay people and that they're against uh, legalizing gay marriage and all these kinds of things. And uh, there's the non-denominational evangelicalism that I recognize. Right. <laughs> right. So yeah. in the seventies and eighties for various reasons right. that I could speculate, that just wasn't a concern. You know, there, we the non-denominational Christians weren't politicized. I don't remember right. anything. I, rem- yeah. I, I remember a couple of things as you might've heard in the episode that I talked about. I remember at a camp that we went to, I remember a, teacher that wasn't from my church talking about how John Denver was evil because he talked about sunshine on my shoulders makes me high. (laughs) And I remember at the age of eight thinking that person was stupid because John Denver is an American treasure. I knew that at the age of eight. So it was very occasional. And I, I worry about people today. You know, I worry about the state of mainstream Christianity today. It really... It's, I think oh, there's it's so much bad... that Christianity can give us that I think is yeah. is lost to people because of the political differences. Yeah, it's in a bad way, and it will reap the whirlwind, to use some scriptural language, um, and it already is. I mean, the, the exodus of young people, especially out of evangelicalism, it, it's only with all the politicization of this next election you know, baked in, and then, of course, the fallout baked in, how, whichever way it falls, it's just going to be a, a demographic bloodbath. That's something that we we talk about a lot on the show and kind of mentally preparing myself and, and some of the listeners for. One thing I just want to say, I never say this, but I had a great youth group experience as well. I think it was really one of the places where I came into young adulthood and compared to, for instance, my non-denominational Christian high school, which I also really enjoyed. I had a good high school experience, junior high and high school. But most of the damaging teaching that I got did not come from my church or youth group. Purity culture came from all sides. This was the 90s, and it was completely saturated with True Love Waits conferences and rings and all that shit. Uh, but besides that, most of all the the shitty stuff I got from school, not from youth group. And so, and uh, in fact, I'm still very close friends with many people from youth group, you know, 20 years later. I just wanted to say that. You mentioning the loving thing, my dad has been a therapist for 40 years, and uh, one of his lifelong best friends and colleagues uh, has one time said to me, my job is to professionally love people. And I didn't really know what that meant when he told me this was before I was in a program. I think it was, in fact, when I was calling him to kind of help discern whether or not I would start the program. But now having read a little bit about different modalities and like Carl Rogers and the client-centered approach and this idea that a lot of what therapy is, is just making an alliance with another person, giving them unconditional positive regard so they feel safe and heard, and then just like helping them get shit out of the way as they try and progress. And that for the most part, people's progress will be actual. Like people want real progress. They want to be actually healthier. They want to love their loved ones better unless they are sociopathic or have certain kinds of personality disorders, m- most people, if you remove impediments, will become better, will become more loving themselves. And so it's been interesting to kind of get a little bit of theoretical language around that more colloquial way that he had told me in that conversation. Yeah, I'm glad that you're inspired by that and, and that you see that it's kind of a rare thing. And given that you're just starting in the profession that's even more pronounced because a lot of novice therapists feel this need to appear ultra clinical and, and dry and science based, you know, quote unquote, of course, love is science based. I just want to point that out. And Carl Rogers is one of the most science based therapies there is. It's often not characterized that way by people who are trying to grasp for resources, but I'm curious, did you grow up in the area? 
No, I grew up in uh, the Bay Area in California. Uh, okay. So, you know, kind of culturally similar. West Coast, r- yeah. religious, but not. And, and I have some questions I want to get to sort of like the unchurched aspect of Seattle. Yeah. But no, I, I grew up in California. L- let's start with some definitions here. Just as a clinician and as a professor, what are your definitions of the terms religion and spirituality? Well, I'm not an expert on this area, so bear with me as I probably muddle my way through this thinking off the top of my head, but religion is a set of things to people, and it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, right? But when I think of religion, I think of an organized group of people with a text that they follow or mull over, if you will. Every religion has its own text that they follow, literal text and also ancillary texts, if you will. And there are certain principles that they follow and certain rituals and ceremonies, and there's meaning and community. So that's what I would say is, and religion obviously has history, and that's a big part of the meaning of people in the, in the current times. So that's what I would say religion is. And religion, you could say, obviously, with that definition could extend into Scientology. It could extend into other kinds of belief systems, if you will, that aren't always considered to be religion, but according to the broad definition, you know, it's, it's a religion. And the way that you've described it could exist without God as well. Right. Without even particular beliefs about God. Right. And, you know, locally, and I don't know how prevalent it is in San Francisco. I'm guessing it's similar. The universalists, Unitarians, well, from my observation, except congregants who are atheists, right. you know, yep. so they are a religion that proposes the idea of like, well, it's possible there is no God and, and you can participate still yeah. in the humanist notions and, and celebration in our congregation. So that's my defini- definition of religion. Spirituality, when I think of that word and I think about the social construction in our society in Seattle and maybe the West Coast is the more broader concept of of a personal vibe or feeling or belief system that there's something greater, something greater than the physical world, a metaphysical existence of some kind. And it can range obviously from hard and fast, you know, religion, Catholicism, this sort of thing to just a general sense of a, of a greater meaning of, you could argue that it's spiritual to say that the universe it, it appears to cycle itself, that it, there's the big bang and then there's the expansion and then the, the great, you know, energy death. And then eventually there's another big bang and, and your awe and your sense of the, that we're all right. stardust. And, and, and even though that's hyper rational, practical science, you could argue that, you know, felt in a certain way, expressed in a certain way, it could absolutely be spiritual. And, oh, yeah. Um, so that's my definition of those two things. Yeah, that's that that works pretty well with um, Doug Shirley, who's a professor at Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. And when I interviewed him about a year ago, his kind of simple breakdown is spirituality is is related to kind of the spark, the desire for transcendence that basically all human beings have. And religion is the way that that uh, gets codified in certain groups. And then of course that's relates to texts and rituals and behaviors and teachings and all of that stuff uh, and gatherings and, and whatnot, which I think is, that's pretty good. So as a professor, I'm curious what kinds of questions your students tend to bring up around the overlap of psychology and religion and spirituality. Yeah, it's a great question. So you're at the Seattle School. I'm guessing you're experienced. I'm actually at Northwest, yeah. Oh, okay. I just know people at all the programs. Oh, okay. Well, I'm guessing people at Seattle School and SPU and these other more overtly religious graduate. But if you're not aware and you're listening to this, in Seattle, we have a number of different graduate programs that teach mental health clinicians, and most of them are actually Christian-based. Yeah, it's weird. In Seattle School, I was talking to one of our administrators And she said they actually produce the highest number of therapists of any of the schools in Seattle, which is a quite non-religious city. So there's something very 
it's very odd that that's the case. Yeah. I would question that figure, honestly, because Antioch is gigantic. Um, and I used to be a program director and I used to monitor all those marketing numbers. Of course, I don't have them in front of me now. Yeah, but that might be true. Yeah. But regardless of that, there's a large percentage of Seattle graduates who are graduating from the various different, even, for example, PLU, it's a Lutheran university. And then we have Antioch, which is often confused with being a religious organization because Antioch is associated with, because there's a lot of churches called Antioch. Yeah, it's in New Testament somewhere. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a great question. And what I'll say at Antioch is that I get no questions about religion or spirituality as a professor. And so I have to bring it up. And when I do bring it up, there's a lot of tension in the room because the dominant discourse is that religion is bad and that it harms people and that it doesn't have a place in mental health discussions. Now I'm exaggerating, but sure. if you pulled like 20 people and just asked them at Antioch, like what their position is, I, I would guess that of the different categories of responses, a pretty dominant response would be that. And of course there's a silent group of people who are either overtly Christian in their lives now, or at least friendly to it, and are afraid to bring it up because of worries that it's going to be stomped on. Now, it varies from professor to professor. There was a professor who taught at Antioch for 30 years, and she was overtly Christian and had a cross that she would wear a jewelry cross um, that she would wear when she would teach. And so she probably got, you know, other sorts of responses, but, but I insert it um, into the discussions because for most people, they are religious and for most yeah. people, or at least spiritual, spiritual. And for these people, at least a good chunk of their lives is uh, seen through that lens, experienced through that reality and processed through that uh, meaning system. And for you not to bring it up as a therapist is like not asking them how they feel, in my opinion. Yeah, that particular position, which I have not encountered, but again, I am at a overtly religious institution, although it's worth noting that the undergraduate institution of Northwest University is quite like standard evangelical. We do not have to like go to chapel and <laughs> do all that. Like we're, you know, we're related, but I could not go if I had to engage in that, the kind of undergraduate stuff. But like the research does not bear out that view that religion is harmful, at least not in a clinical setting. I mean, I, I've been doing research towards my dissertation recently. And it's like, you see the articles that pop up are like, religious people are happier, but why? Right. So it's not like they, it's agreed. <laughs> they are happier. It, it, it clearly can be a help in people's healing from grief, from trauma, whatever. I don't know how much psychopathology you teach, but I'm sure you're aware of these culture bound syndromes that only occur in certain cultural uh, environments. And they often like recommend you bring the priest or the shaman or the whatever in because it actually helps people heal. And it's like mm -hmm. clinically backed up. So uh, I'm a little bit shocked that people would have sort of that unnuanced of a view about religion if they are attempting to be steeped in the clinical research, right? The, the academic research. The other thing that I'll say is I, I find myself sort of in between what's going on in your classes and then uh, what I get a lot at Northwest because uh, a lot of the faculty are kind of evangelical, you know, they're baby boomers or just below that and um, a little bit younger, you know, and I am like, it ends up being tense when religion comes up in my classes because I'm pushing back on the simplistic sort of evangelical notions of how we might combine religion and mental health and psychology and the very, in various theological concepts. And I'm kind of always like, Actually, it's theologically more complex than that. And there are liberals and they think this. And so it's funny the the tension comes, I, I would say like a third or half of my cohort is non-religious. So it's not like all, all evangelicals. And we have a couple Mormons, like sort of pseudo practicing Mormons. And it's, we have the whole gamut, but it's just funny that <laughs> the, the tension is quite different there. Yeah. Yeah. And I commend you for speaking that side of things, because that's a scary place to be as a student to say, hey, well, there's more nuance there. Uh, and I'm sure your fellow classmates are like, 
you know, I hope Dan says something because uh, I'm thinking maybe, it, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, maybe. Yeah, I, I don't get too scared in, in situations like that. Maybe I sh- should be more deferential no, no, no. or whatever. I don't know. No, no, no. I mean, I don't know about your professors, but that worry I've often heard from students that somehow they're going to be, they're going to experience retrib- retribution grade downs, you know, downgrading in, in, at the end of the quarter. And I've, I've literally never seen that in a professor. Yeah. Professors are uh, not petty third graders. But no. the other thing that I'll say, you know, getting back to what you said about the research is, yeah, I've experienced that a lot. And I don't know how much of the podcast you listen to beyond what you've listened to, but I have a co-host that I've been with for 12 years, Umberto Castaneda, and he grew up in, in Colombia and I don't know exactly his exact upbringing, but he has, he has a 110% negative view about, about religion. And, uh, you know, he grew up in a Catholic country and experienced a lot of bad things, apparently. And, and he actually has, hist- in his DNA history, he found out that he's part Spanish, which means that under the Christian, you know, cross, right. his, his people committed terrible atrocities over centuries throughout yep. uh, the Americas. And that's what he thinks of when he thinks of any religion or any spirituality for that matter. Yeah. And so when I bring up any kind of research over the past 12 years, when I, when I, you know, research that you're pointing out that religion is a protective factor for a lot of things, it's a protective factor for suicide, protective factor for various different mental conditions. Now, you know, what do we do with that information? Do we take an atheist and try to convert them? Right. Um, no. no, that's, yeah. no, that's not what we're saying. But what we're saying is that, there is health potential in meaning making, in community, in comfort of a God that may or may not exist, in believing that something is bigger than yourself. All those various different things that are common across different religious uh, traditions. Or, you know, literally God exists and when you believe in him, he helps you out. There's no way to scientifically prove or disprove that hypothesis, but these are things that when I say it to Umberto and other people, they'll be like, well, you know, they, they can't just accept the data, right? They, because of, of the traumas that they've been through and the traumas they've observed in other people, it is just an impossible pill to swallow for them. And I will often try to loosen people up <laughs> Not because I'm trying to convert, because I'm not uh, at all, at all, but just to be open, you know, to the positive and negatives that religion can provide. Yeah, I want to, I'm going to come back to trauma there, spiritual trauma, because that is the focus of my own eventual dissertation. But also, one of the ways that I try to not fall into the opposite trap, right, which is like, oh, look. The research just shows religion's good, so Christianity is true, like a kind of a stupid, poorly thought out move, is I try to be very honest about what the research shows that is negative about religion in people's lives. And the the biggest takeaway, it seems to me, is that religion makes us groupish, right? So that has some short-term benefits, and maybe happiness is one of those, and perhaps uh, the more groupish you get, you take your wedding vows more seriously, you get divorced less often, you might whatever, you, you have all this meaning as being a part of a group, but they show over and over again that there are negative outgroup consequences, right? So people who are more religious will tend to get higher scores on xenophobia. They will do worse in terms of how they think about people who are not in their in-group on, on various measures, right? And so for liberal Christians like myself, the, the sort of quest is how do we maintain the good stuff without the, that negative byproduct. And I might be a little cynical, but I think that probably some of that negative byproduct is baked into the cake from the beginning. To some extent, as you feel part of a group, you will feel less part of an out group. But I comfort myself in that Christ seems to constantly be pushing the boundaries of the in-group. Somebody asks him, uh, what shall I do to be saved? And then he says, "What? how does the Torah read to you? And he says, Love the Lord God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, that's right. Do this and you shall live. Another guy pipes up and says, well, who is my neighbor? 
And that's when Jesus tells the good Samaritan. So like the good Samaritan, which in our day could be like the good illegal immigrant or something like that, right? It's like this person that you think is not a Jew, is not part of your group. That is the person who really loves the way that God loves. And so that's always the tension. And we got to be careful, not just selectively choosing the research that supports being religious and ignoring the stuff that says, and then here are the sort of drawbacks of it. Yeah, I really love that. I mean, that's that's really a message that I see some Christians promote. Obviously, it needs to be, you know, greater promoted. And to, in my opinion, it comes down to leadership. So if you're a leader of a, a religious community and you have racist ideas or you're not very enlightened yourself, then that's going to trickle down. Whereas if you are enlightened and you do spend the time and you aren't afraid to sacrifice some of your popularity, you know, the problem right now is that politics and the news and the echo chamber and religion is so intertwined that religious leaders, from my perspective, in order to stay solvent, I mean, these are people trying to start a business. I mean, that, that's what it is. And to say that it's not is t- to completely ignore the reality. You know, God doesn't send money to, so that the, you know, ministers and the staff people can pay their bills. Yeah. It's, the, it's the congregants. The congregants give money to, and that, that's how it happens. Well, if you say unpopular things politically, then you go out of business and yeah. then you have no church. And even if you are enlightened, well, no one's going to be listening to you. And so it's a vicious cycle. And that's the problem is that it's economic as all problems stem from. Yeah, it's uh, the, the buck stops with the average congregant news viewer, et cetera. And the way that I think about it is as Christians, we might hope that our discipleship of Christ would be the thing that primarily forms us forms our character, forms our behaviors, our rituals, our practices, our decisions. And sometimes that's true. But increasingly, I interpret Jesus's thing about the narrow road and the and the wide road as having nothing to do with heaven and hell and everything to do with this question, that actually most people who live their lives under the banner of Christianity are not formed by that as much as they are formed by other things. And What happens to be true today and maybe wasn't true 40 years ago is that our sociopolitical identity is the primary forming agent of all Americans right now. And if, if it's not for you, then you are the exception. And so people, you know, the, the, the simplest answer to the question, why are all my evangelical parents and their friends voting for Trump? The shortest answer is they are formed by Fox news, other conservative media, their sociopolitical identity, which has been trending this direction since the mid seventies. And, you know, they're frogs in the water in some sense, unless they are one of the few who has gone, Oh, hold on. This isn't working for me. I need to be formed by something else. Then of those people, a big chunk are, are conversely formed by their new sociopolitical left identity. And that is the shortest answer for why they oppose Trump. And, and only some percentage of each side oppose or support Trump for like sort of what we might call genuine reasons. They've really thought about it. They've really done the work and they have concluded this thing. Uh, And for me, and I talk about all the time ad nauseum, but Jonathan Haidt's Righteous Mind has been the the single most helpful kind of book and and rubric for thinking about these things. Any more to add on that topic before we move to spiritual trauma? No, I, I really like that. That makes a lot of sense. And The thing that I thought of was my mom. My mom uh, is a devout Christian. And I remember early in the 90s, we were talking about gay rights. And she just simply said, and she she doesn't go to graduate school. And this is before any internet or anything. And I just remember her saying, you know, I've heard some Christians say that gay people are wrong. But that just doesn't make any sense to me because they're good people and that's how God made them. So that's the end of that. <laughs> and I, I just, and you know, I had all these uh, political kinds of angles to take with it. And my mom, she just simply, she just looked at it and said, I, 
that does just just doesn't make sense to me. Just another side note about my mom in high school in Spokane, Washington, fell in love with my dad. My mom's white, white blonde hair, and my dad is Japanese. And at the time, it was literally illegal for my parents to date or get married. Across the United States, it was various different states. It was illegal for my parents to get married. And I asked my mom, I was like, how did you get over that? She's just like, well, the racism just didn't make sense to me. So I wasn't going to go along with it. <laughs> and so it's just a simple evaluation of reality or, or ethics. It's a common or sense thing for her. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. kind of following her heart. There's good examples of people following their hearts and then there's bad examples, right? If she's following love, then there are basically no bad examples of people following love. Right. But there are bad examples of people following their un, unreflected intuitions, for sure, right? That's people can get, um, and I, of course, I don't mean to, I'm not critic criticizing your mom. No, I uh, get it. Of course. Um, but let's talk about spiritual trauma, because uh, this is something that not only are a lot of listeners interested in, but as I said, this is what I plan to focus on in my own work. You mentioned the sort of spiritual trauma of your friend and co-host, Umberto, but I'm wondering about clients. So obviously keeping everybody confidential, what are some examples of, of stuff that, you know, Seattle, I find anecdotally, there's a lot of religious trauma in this city. People move here often from the Midwest or the South or other parts of the country that are more conservative, where uh, as one might, my, my uh, recurring guest, Terry Shoemaker, who's a sociologist puts it, spiritual humidity or religious humidity is higher. Uh, it has, it exerts more gravitational pressure on people than it does here on the West coast. So I just imagine it must come up in, in your office. So I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. I don't know if there's any commonality and I don't know if any of the stories that I would reference would be that surprising, but obviously being literally sexually traumatized by a leader or a extension of the church and then subsequently told to be quiet about it or something. We've all known those stories and I've heard those stories, but I think more commonly it's a sense of family breakdown where you as a kid just wasn't that into it and your parents were, or one of your parents were very into it and it created this rift in the family where you were identified as the bad kid and it fueled an already dysfunctional system problem that led to even more distance and more neglect and more feeling as though you don't matter. You know, for a child to feel like your parents are choosing their religion over you. Over you, yeah. Yeah, which some religions will overtly say. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, Jehovah's Witness, for instance, like active shunning, you know, if, you, if you're if you out, you are fucking out. Yeah. And and the, yeah, the and there, loyalty fair, is more important. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a fair amount of Jehovah Witnesses that are in Seattle and I've treated a lot of them active and not active. Um, other things that I've heard are women who are in a marriage and they want a divorce, but their religion and, and their community is saying that that is just not an option. And if you do, you're going to be essentially excommunicated and sent to hell. And so they're in this totally tough position to be in. I've talked with people about that. But I think mainly what I hear is, is what I said in the middle there is family difficulty being exacerbated by people taking sides about what religion it's supposed to be in the family. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because I am not one of the kids who didn't take it seriously. And almost nobody who listens to this podcast was one of those kids or else they would not listen to this podcast. They'd be listening to Bill Simmons or Fresh Air or whatever else, you know, Joe Rogan, because the whole point of this show is like, <laughs> you could say like, okay, so you care deeply about faith, but you have these problems. That would be like, that's the one liner intro, you know, I could give to, to somebody like the elevator pitch for you have permission. Um, but once I do this work clinically, I will get a lot of those clients that that will just be, I'm just kind of flagging that for myself as something interesting to think about you know, the level of how serious one takes it. And if it's, when it's the family member that takes it seriously and it's not you, how that looks from the outside. And that's, that's really interesting. But you also mentioned hell and I, I'm curious, fear of hell is one of those topics that I am just so interested in because 
on the one hand, it is so absolute. It is literally the worst possible thing you could ever tell anybody would happen to them. And on the other hand, there appear to be really kind of hard psychic limits for most people about what they can really believe about. Like, for instance, there's research that shows that almost nobody who believes that hell is concrete, eternal, people are going there, believes that they're going there, right? Like, it's like 2% or less than 1% or something, because you can't believe that, right? Like, you have to basically be in incredibly self-loathing or something like that to believe that you're going to experience that thing. My question for you, that was a big lead up, I apologize, is what do you notice about your client's actual beliefs about hell? Like, do they believe it? Like, what's your professional opinion of their sort of cognitive state? Or do they repeat things that they've heard the way that they've been said? Or you know what I'm saying? You see what I'm getting at? Yeah. Well, it's the broader answer I'll say is on average, most of the clients, when we get into this topic, which I don't always with every client, there's a lot of amorphous agnostics in Seattle who have a general belief that there is something greater. And they might have uh, kind of pseudo Christian, or if they grew up Jewish, like pseudo Jewish or pseudo Mormon ideas that they don't really identify as Christian. You know, like karma is an idea that people often go to that isn't from the East, it's from the West. <laughs> that idea actually yeah. comes from the Christian and the Jewish Bible. So, but anyway, so most of the people that I guess on average I talk to would probably say, no, they don't really believe in a hell and they might believe in a, a nice afterlife. I feel, I feel like there's a, I don't know if it's just the people I run into, but I feel like there's a lot of people who personally and professionally, when I ask them this question, because I'm actually curious as a person who thinks about this a lot, I find that people's ideas are fairly unformed. They have ideas, but when I ask them, because they'll give me sort of an amorphous answer and then I'll say, well, do you believe in an afterlife? Because that's one of the questions that I actually ask a lot of my clients when they've lost someone hmm. close to them. Yeah, it's relevant. Uh, yeah, they'll say like, well, you know, and they'll kind of give a long answer as if this is the first time they've really spoke out loud about it, right? Now, obviously, if you're a Christian, you go to church every Sunday, you're probably going to have an answer to that. But, but a lot of people in Seattle don't, as you say, like the unchurched, right? Um, even churched people have you know, ambiguity about yeah, this. They don't necessarily buy the party line. Right. So consequently, I anecdotally would say most people don't even consider hell to be like a viable possibility. Otherwise, I think they would do something about it. <laughs> you know, if you, if yeah. you even kind of believe in hell, you know, this is one of my favorite arguments to make is like, yeah. nobody does. The only people who act like they do, we think are have mental disorders, basically, you yeah. know, like the person screaming at you at the baseball game is the only person acting like they really believe in hell. And most of us think it's probably something up with that guy. Right. So yeah. there, there is a funny disconnect there. Yeah. And, and I try to promote that idea. I try to tell people because so many people in my circle look at sort of fundamentalist religious people as totally wacko. And, and what I what I try to impart on them is what I grew up actually believing. Uh, that was a big part of my upbringing was hell. I remember there was not a lot of talk about it, but there was, there was some overt talk about it. And yeah. what I try to tell people is like, look, if we all understand that there's religion, right? And there's religious people. And if you're in that camp of which there are many and you believe in hell, then it is imperative that you try to save people from going there. And you're the most moral person on the planet to be standing on the corner and trying to alert people to the fact that they might be suffering and going, they're not, these people aren't a-holes. These are like, right. this comes from love. Now you could be annoyed with it and you could be bothered by it, but don't look at that person and think that they're some kind of jerk face for doing it. Like from where they come, this is a wonderful thing that, that they are doing. Right. It, it's, they are loving you in the way that they want to love you. You could be annoyed, but, but don't look at it like they're evil. Right. Yeah. I would tend to think of them as being misled and maybe dealing with some mental health issues like religious scrupulosity or something where they feel like if they don't perform really perfectly, God will hate. I mean, they, there could be quite a bit of dark shit under the surface, uh, or they could just be like fairly straightforward, 
simple people, not in the sense of simple minded, but just like, this is what I believe. And this is, I think the best way to spend my day or whatever. Yeah. And I'm doing it because I care about these people. And, you know, I think they're wrong, but they're not a jerk for it. Right. Right. I always think about this one metaphor that a minister, not the minister at my church, but I went to a friend's church in Bellevue and, and it was actually um, Ken Hutchinson. I think his name he was an ex, he was an ex uh, Seahawks player. Oh, okay. And very popular. And, um, and I loved his church because all the Seahawks went to that church, Kenny Easley, these kind of people. Anyway, he gave this one metaphor this one time. He said, okay, what we are in this room, this is what we are like. We are like people who are driving in a car and we're going to a bridge and we see that the bridge is out and there's a cliff into certain death and we slam on the brakes but there's fog. I remember, you know, there's, it's hard to yeah, see. You don't you have very good visibility. Sure, yeah. Yeah. And so you get out of the car and you see cars coming down the road and you're waving your arms saying, don't go down this road because there's certain death and destruction and terribleness. And we are the people on the side of the road screaming, you know, right. uh, and waving our arms. I, I still remember that to this day. I, it applies to a lot of situations, I think, but when I think of those people on the corner or the people who come yeah. to my door and even Jehovah witnesses for that matter, I, I think that's where they're coming from and that's what they're trying to do. Yep. Whether or not I'm on board with that, I, I know where that comes from. Yeah. I used to use that metaphor as well. And it described my understanding of what I was doing when I was much more overtly evangelistic uh, in my efforts. And, and, you know, I've just come to believe over time not least because of Jonathan Haidt's work that like, it doesn't work. That's not how people's minds are changed, first of all. And then second of all, of course, I don't believe in that kind of eternal punishment anymore. So what's the cliff I'm saving them from? It's probably more like themselves than it is hell or something. And if you're saving people from themselves, then that's even more nuanced and complex. And you really realize you just got to lean into loving people, basically, which even as a clinician, as you brought up, I wanted to ask you, a little bit more about the kind of research that you end up, I know you're not an expert in the religion and spirituality research, but you do know some stuff and, and you've been practicing with clients for a long time. So when you're in a session with a client and something comes up around religion and spirituality, uh, what, what do you tend to call to mind or use with them or what's sort of the the strongest, most empirically backed stuff that you feel most confident in, in using to respond to these sort of religious or spiritual concerns or problems? Well, I don't typically get spiritual or religious concerns directly, but there's two main things that I often bring up. And I tell all my trainees this as well, because I, I want them to consider it. The first one is what I mentioned earlier, is that when someone dies in their life, I always ask, do you believe in an afterlife? Because even if you're not religious, you might believe that they, you know, people will say, I, I just feel like their presence is still with me. And that's an important detail to know about your clients in terms of how they process loss. And you need to know that as a clinician. Now, if they just believe their lights are turned off and they're gone, then that's, you also need to know that as well. But if they believe that they're present, or they literally believe that they can directly commune with that person. Okay. So that's one Good question that I, yeah, yeah, that's one question yeah. that I feel like is if you don't ask, why are you not asking that question? That's a pretty important question to ask people who have lost someone and frequently people come to therapy having lost them. The other question I ask is more prompted when I see people struggling with the meaning of their life, which is frequent because even just depression, I think is a often a crisis of lack of purpose. I will ask, one, do you believe in God? And two, what does God want for you? Or what is your purpose? What purpose does God want you to have on this planet? Or if you're, uh, you believe in reincarnation, what does the universe have, you know, for your purpose? There's a reason why you're on this planet. It's, or do you believe that there's a reason, you know? And so most people do. Most people believe that, or a lot of people believe that either there is a God or a universe that has ideas about humans or even us in particular and contemplating that question and coming to your own answer, I think is a antidote to a lot of problems that people come to therapy for. Yeah, that's good. What about like mindfulness or some of the, 
some of the research around prayer and more in the abstract, not necessarily the like those studies they try to do with intercessory prayer, uh, where they're trying to prove if it works or not, which uh, I had a client who told a really funny story of her, her son reading about those and, and telling her his mom, mom, I just invalidated all those studies because I went and prayed for all those people. <laughs> right. It's like th- those ones are uh, silly, but, but the, the sort of the internal effects of prayer, right. The, mm-hmm. the brain functions and stuff like that. Uh, do, do you do mindfulness stuff with your clients? Do you consider that to be similar to prayer? Is that something that other therapists do more than you? I'm just curious about any of that stuff. Yeah. I know a lot of people who use mindfulness. I don't, I like mindfulness. It's just not really my style. And I have a much more relational interpersonal direct way of working with people. And that's more homeworky to me, especially if they're not doing it. Yeah. But I totally value that and hundred um, percent understand the research that supports mindfulness as a thing, how it relates to prayer. And I, I guess your other question of, it's probably clear that I don't recommend prayer. I, you know, I don't suggest it to people. You don't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but if it does come up and people they like in that, you know, I could see a scenario and I can remember a handful of where someone's struggling with the purpose of their life. And I'll, and I might ask the question, you know, what does God or the universe want from you? And then I, I might say, well, they, and they might be confused. I mean, like, well, I don't know. It's like, I, I don't know what the purpose of my life is. And, and yeah, you know, I don't know what God's wants for me. Then I'll be like, well, do you talk to God? Do you ask when you ask God, what does God say? Or are there signs when you think right now about God, in the room with us right now, what do you think he would tell you? Can you hear God? Obviously not in the hallucination sense, but in the, you know, in the sense that most personal spirituality people have. And that's the way I grew up. That was the the version of Christianity I grew up with was the everyone has a personal relationship with God and no one else can comment on that. And so I'll definitely ask that question. And I guess that relates to prayer. And I certainly recognize the data pointing in the direction that prayer provides a lot of things that in positive psychology that we point out of gratitude. So a lot of prayer traditions, grace for your meal, you're you know, expressing gratitude for the meal. That has been shown to have tremendous positive effects on average for people. Having a sense that there's an all-knowing, all-loving presence that is looking out for you. Uh, obviously would have a lot of benefits to that. Processing your thoughts quietly or communally um, obviously has a lot of benefits as well. As well, Having positive thoughts about another person and saying, I pray for uh, this person or the, this group of people um, can have a lot of positive outcomes as well. So I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it's good. It, it, it sort of does. And it leads me in a, a couple little directions for the last few minutes here. I was just listening to this fantastic interview that Ezra Klein did. I forget the guy's name. Is it Cyrus Habib? Uh, He is a blind, he's the Lieutenant governor of the state of Washington and he is not running for reelection. A lot of people thought he would become governor, especially if Biden wins and Inslee becomes um, secretary of environment or whatever the, whatever that is called the environmental cabinet position that this guy might've become governor and he he's becoming a Jesuit. He left politics. He's taking a vow of abstinence, uh, poverty and obedience, and he's becoming a Jesuit. And, uh, he had been in conversation with Ezra Klein, who's an atheist. And Ezra had been doing the examine, which is like the primary Jesuit prayer that you do at the end of the day. And you can do it in a non-religious kind of a way. But one of the things, the first thing you do is you search back through your day with gratefulness and you find the stuff and you sort of meditate on in that soft sense, you know, the, the good things in your day and where you found meaning. And then you also look for the stuff that you didn't do the way you'd want to do it. And, you know, all of that. So it just reminded me of that. And when you said gratitude has been shown to be helpful, I'm, I'm really interested in this kind of in the positive psychology stuff and and the relationship between classic conversations about virtues, you know, gratitude, humility, forbearance, stuff like that. You also mentioned the sense of having someone looking out for you or whatever. And I've been thinking about this a lot. So this will be my last question, but we have a six month old and we have started reading books to him. Uh, we, we've had to be quite careful which Christian books we are happy with given our modified uh, set of beliefs and our desire to avoid harming him 
uh, with vengeful God, stuff like that. But we've started to read these books that are like, God loves you. And that's the thing that I believe is true. I cognitively believe it. And I also experientially believe it based on my prayer practice. And of course, I can't prove it. I can't prove it to myself, much less prove it to Soren, my six month old. But I have been thinking about it and and I just, I wanted to pick your brain. So coming from, you know, pretty clinical, non-religious angle here, what is that benefit of having that sort of belief that, yeah, there is a benevolent force looking out for me in some sense? I, I don't happen to believe that God is like supernaturally removing obstacles for me and like favoring me over other people or anything like that. I don't believe that and I will not teach Soren to believe that to the extent that I can, but I do believe that God loves me and cares for me and that that kind of love is at the center of creation, big bang, whatever the universe existing and my ability to be a sentient being in that universe and experience the insane gracious gift that is life. Okay. That was preachy, but you can not respond to that. Just the, the straight question of what, what is the benefit? Like if Soren can grow up with that sense firmly, as opposed to not having that sense. What benefit does that confer? Well, a tremendous benefit, and data shows this, that when one has a sense that life has meaning, one, and that you have meaning, and that meaning does transcend atoms and quarks and this kind of thing, then it feels good. You know, for me, whether it's by God or the universe or my humanistic leanings, I, my mission in life, my purpose in life is to try to make the world a better place. And I don't know if I ever succeed, but that, that's what I try to do. And I could die at any point and say, well, I know I was in line with my purpose and I'm satisfied with what I did with my time overall. So there's that benefit. The other benefit is, like we've been saying, the comfort of two things. One, that an all-powerful, all-knowing creature or presence is looking out for me. That is a wonderful feeling that Soren probably has anyway because you and you know your family is looking over Soren. So you will hopefully have quite secure attachment. Right. <laughs> well, you just will. The thing I tell parents is limit your damage so that he only needs five years of therapy when, yeah, when he's right. an adult. Exactly. Yeah. That's the best you can hope for, honestly. So that's a tremendous benefit. So a, yet another presence besides you in his life that is there for him. And, and when he is eight years old, 15 years old, and he doesn't feel like he could talk to you or he's alone and he stares into the darkness and he sees a loving God that is a tremendous comfort. And we live in a, in a world now that we need more of that. We're more isolated. There's more threats to our well-being and safety and threats to connection that to have that presence, whether rational or not, has so many benefits to it. Uh, now, as you talk, I don't think I've ever answered a question like this before. And as we talk about it, it's like... <sighs> Obviously, there's other ways to do it aside from talking about a god, right? You, you could talk about meaning in general. You could talk about ancestors. You could talk about doing the right thing for your own ego to observe yourself having done something that, would you know, like you're your best judge and jury. At the end of the day, can you look at yourself and see that you did what you needed to do? You know, there's a lot of different angles, atheist and religious, um, you know, combined. But focusing on that and having some way of imparting that on your children, I think, is, is a wonderful thing. It's just, it's, it's wonderful. Dr. Honda, thank you so much, man, for your time. Great conversation. And thank you for inviting me on. I love talking about this, as I think is evident. And uh, no one ever asked me about this because we live <laughs> in an unchurched Seattle. <laughs> All right. Well, that was my interview with Dan Koch from the You Have Permission podcast. Check it out if you're interested. And let me know what you think. Comment below, email us, go to our website, contact us, and let us know your own experiences. I'm guessing that this at least provoked some thoughts in your own stories. And, you know, let me know what you think. I, I think we should be talking about this more often. 
because for a lot of reasons. <laughs> One is it's an important part of most people's lives. And also I find that when it comes to religion, only certain types of voices get propagated through our society, which I don't think is a good idea. That does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do. Thank you.